Well, welcome once again to Outbreak, everyone. Um, just a quick announcement before we uh, get started. Uh, next Wednesday, which is December the 13th, there'll be a special program around the exhibition, Lines of Abstraction, which is currently on display in the Joy Light Gallery. And this will be a curatorial conversation um, hosted by uh, the co-curators of the exhibit, uh, Wen Chung Cho and Daniel Greenberg. And they will be talking about the life and work of the um, noted painter, calligrapher, and collector C.C. Wang, whose works on display. So um, again, that's next Wednesday uh, evening. I'm sorry, next, yeah, next Wednesday evening, December 13th. Uh, the tickets are $5 for members and $10 for members. Well, I think as all of you know by now, we're heading into the 100th anniversary year of the KIA. And I think it's kind of wonderful that we're getting a little bit of a jump on it with this program about uh, the Kirk Newman Art School, uh, because the uh, art classes have always been a really vital part of the organization since it was founded, really um, essential to its vision. Um, the first director of the actual KIA school, when they moved into the new building in 1961, was Kirk Newman. I want to say just a couple words about Kirk, because I think his uh, philosophy and approach really uh, was followed through uh, and still is kind of alive today as a, a legacy. Uh, Kirk very seriously believed that potentially art was for everyone. And by that, he felt that Art classes could be offered to the community at a very uh, high level, uh, comparable, say, to a university course, and that if presented in the right way, they would um, they would draw uh, participants. And another thing that he felt uh, was very important, he, as much as possible, he wanted to have uh, practicing artists as teachers. And I think this was, a, I think, a note one of his insights, because he knew that if an artist is actually working and producing things, they're involved with the creative process, and something of that uh, excitement or awareness really passes on to their, their students as well. So um, he also had a really keen eye for knowing which artists would maybe make good teachers, which isn't always the case, as you know. Um, and, um, Often, I think he knew before they knew. And uh, one of the um, people that he hired in 1973 was Tom Kendall, who came to uh, run the ceramics uh, program here at the KIA. And uh, during Tom's uh, tenure here, he really built up the ceramic program to the level that it is now. I mean, it's, as those of you who participate know, it's really professional. The studios are wonderfully equipped, and there's a great variety of uh, classes. Um, in addition to his uh, other talents, I think Tom really brought uh, kind of an enthusiasm to this, which I think was something else that was really transmitted to the students and other teachers in the environment, and uh, made a number of innovations, had some new ideas, including he thought, uh, well, maybe we'll have a little ceramic sale around the holidays time and raise some money for the school. And that turned into what we just uh, had uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, but all the time, Tom is also working as a practicing artist. He has his own studio, Oak Leaf Pottery. And uh, he's done other major projects, including uh, a ceramic installation piece uh, at uh, Bronson Hospital in one of the courtyards. Um, Tom was followed as uh, directed by Denise Lisecki, and Denise has a very long history with the KIA, going back you know, almost about 40 years. I remember he first came down to take her class from Tom in ceramics, which I thought was interesting. And uh, even though Denise herself is a very uh, gifted uh, screen printer and uh, watercolorist, 
And so she's another one of these artist teachers and her classes in watercolor were uh, kind of remarkable. She offered a very different approach than the standard watercolor class. She was teaching a lot with watercolor, composition, color theory, and uh, these were uh, uh, very popular. Uh, under Denise's tenure, the um, class offerings really expanded. Uh, she introduced classes in uh, creative writing, in foreign language, and yoga, just a, sort of a variety of non traditional sort of enrichment programs. So that um, by the time she left, I think there were around, um, there were over 300 classes offered at the KIA. And they were participated in by 3,000 students, which I thought was just remarkable from where things started. And I want to mention that she too uh, was all this time was a practicing artist, which I find kind of remarkable. Uh, she's had numerous one person shows, her works are in many uh, corporate and museum collections. And um, so she, she was able to maintain this too, which is no small thing. And of course, we now have a new director, Leslie Donaldson, uh, who I think brings many of the same attributes as our former directors. Certainly, a wide background in um, the art world, uh, working as a, a gallery owner, creator, uh, working in um, community education, uh, a version of advertising, promotion. And so, I think she too will kind of continue this uh, really. Uh, amazing tradition that's been going on. So having that said, you're going to hear from all three of them. Uh, we're, and we're going to start with uh, Tom first, to give a little bit uh, about background about the uh, yeah, so, so please welcome Tom Kimball. <laughs> well, thank you, Greg. I appreciate your, your words. Um, but, but before I begin talking about the school, I wanted to, to thank um, Miriam Thomas, uh, curator for adult program here at the KIA. She was instrumental in pointing me in the right direction, uh, where to find stuff. And uh, she provided me with tons of information right off the bat. So it made my preparation a lot easier. Um, I'd also, again, like to thank Leslie Donaldson for coming and being a part of this. Um, She's the current director of the school and doing a wonderful job. And, and of course, uh, Denise Osecki, uh, who followed me uh, as director of the school. Um, but I was joking with Leslie, I say, with all of these directors here, it seems like we should be having a meeting <laughs> to decide something, you know. So, there's but time. there's hmm? time. There's time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, uh, I'll be talking a lot about the facility, the building itself, and how it developed. Um, and uh, there will be very few names of people other than a few key folks in the KIA. Um, I'll, if I start down that road of naming names, you know, there are hundreds of them. We couldn't have gotten anywhere near where we are now without the help of all of the faculty members, um, the volunteers, um, and uh, uh, and of course, the most generous donors that you could possibly find, I think, for a town this size. And the history of, of contributions by major uh, uh, important people in town started right from the very beginning of the KIA. So with that all being said, I'll go ahead and start my, my narrative. So the history of the uh, Kalamazoo Institute of Arts and the school uh, begins in the, in the, the summer of 1923, um, when Catherine Wood, who was a respected painter, uh, regional painter uh, and, and well-regarded, called a meeting together of interested people in her studio. And I think it was in the Prime building, something like that. But um, the idea, her idea was uh, to have an art center now that's a that's a common term that we you hear all the time now. There are art centers all over the place, but back in the day, this this was not typical. So her what she proposed was to have this art center, which would have art classes, changing exhibitions, and a permanent collection. 
all three of those things working simultaneously, really a one-stop shop for, for the arts. Uh, and the idea was revolutionary and it stuck. Within a few months, really, by February of 1924, uh, um, the uh, Kalamazoo chapter of the American Federation of Arts incorporated Kalamazoo Institute of Arts with constitution and bylaws, and we were on the road. But it was a poor group. It didn't. There was not a lot of money involved at, at this time. Um, in the early years, they had to rent a room at the YMCA and held classes wherever they could find space. Um, but the reputation of the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts grew rapidly. A year later, the Gazette wrote that a group of professional artists had won the co cooperation of the city's prominent art connoisseurs and public spirited individuals. And they were given a gift by Anna Louise Raymond of a sizable portion of her art collection and about a, a, a donation of $20,000, which in today's money would have been about a $300,000 uh, donation. So that was that was right away, uh, right after the start of the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. Um, so by 1928, well, let, oh, let's see here. Um, the first meeting place is, uh, well, oh, okay, I, I guess I said that, that they rented, did I say they rented spaces at the YMCA? All right, by 1928, the YMCA needed its space back. So the KIA cooperated with the Board of Education, which at the time was governed the Kalamazoo Public Library and the Public Museum. Um, at one point, Flora Roberts, the director of the Pup Kalamazoo Public Library, had envisioned that the KIA would become a, an auxiliary of the library. And, uh, but that idea was not acceptable to the board. They had stuck with their core notion that we could be something really special, not a part of, of another organization. So at any rate, they, the KIA still needed a place to meet. And so um, the KIA and the public museum moved into a house. Oh, I got to use this thing. There we go. Moved into the, okay, moved into the Peck House, which was a school board property with the public library's museum on the first floor and the KIA on the second floor. And as the library's museum collection expanded, a 17 year dispute began over space, which was called at the time, the war of the stuffed animals and birds. Right. Just a couple of years later, the KIA and the public museum were moved again to the Coffer House, also owned by the school board. Um, but at that time, the KIA had strong leadership in Branch Hall, um, the, the KIA board president, who introduced a bold new vision for the KIA to make art a living experience open to modern trends and not just static displays. She, and she hired Sylvester Jerry, the first KIA executive director. The first exhibit at the Coffer House was uh, the, uh, of contemporary American art. And it was a very popular show, but the most popular show was uh, an exhibit of Kalamazoo artists. So that shows the strong interest of local art. A year later, which makes it 1932 or so, the KA joined forces with the Pallet and Chisel Club to hold art classes. Let's see if I got that. There we go. And uh, together, then, they formed the basis for the KA's studio program. But the KA studio's program was hobbled because of the lack of a permanent dedicated space. Imagine trying to take, turn a painting studio into a photography studio and then change it again into a pottery studio and back again to a painting studio all in one week, it would be impossible. And so the, what we could offer as a group was limited because we didn't have a, our own home. So fast forward 16 years to 1947 when the KIA purchased and renovated the Victorian mansion on this location. Uh, 
at the corner of uh, Park and at South and Level. Um, and they renovated the um, they renovated the uh, uh, the building and um, let's see. and that ended the contentious relations. And there were contentious relations with the library and the school board. In fact, I think the school board at one point was working to evict the KIA from the from their location. They wanted to get rid of them. So the war of the stuffed animals and birds was over. Two years later, um, uh, in 1949, Kirk Newman came to the KIA as a faculty member with the University of Michigan Extension Service Program, which ran from 1949 to 1955. When the Extension Program ended, Kirk stayed on to become the first director of the KIA school. And Kirk was able to increase public support and inspired people and in, also increased enrollment. The first year in the three newly renovated studios saw 250 studios enrolled in classes. Um, but they had also in this location were able to add ceramics and printmaking dedicated studios, which we now really enjoy for all of our separate meeting. So now things started to change rapidly. Within a decade, plans were underway for a brand new building. But of course, money was a big issue. But in 1958, the Gazette announced that Genevieve and Donald Gilmore would provide funds for a new building, which was opened in 1961 the Genevieve and Donald Gilmore Arts Center. And the basic footprint of, the, of that building are clearly outlined, especially on the east side and the south side. It's a fantastic building designed by Skidmore, Owens and Merrill, and um, uh, is a real monument in, in the in a identifiable monument for art here in the Kalamazoo. So with the opening of the Genevieve and Donald Gilmore Art Center came a new executive director, Fred Maurice. And his first priority was to build up the studio program um, and to fill the generous spaces that we had for, for uh, in many other media and to welcome the community to the art center. So I could imagine that Fred Maurice and Kirk Newman were working closely to design and equip the uh, studios. Now, um, with the expanded studios, uh, enrollment jumped to 500, okay, 1961. And uh, by 1974, it, it had jumped to 1400. And by 1999, it was over uh, or nearly 2000. And Leslie, I think if I got this right, let's see if I do. Uh, in in 2023, we had 3,500 enrollees in classes at the KIA, and and let's see, it would be probably 250, 200, 300, 400 classes. Almost 500. Almost 500. Wow. Okay. So anyway, um, I'm going to kind of jump back a little bit and talk specifically about Kirk Newman. Uh, Kirk was into, uh, in, instrumental in developing the philosophy of the KIA school. And as Greg has pointed out, he envisioned a program based on high expectations for faculty and students with college level classes for art students, uh, of adults and children alike. And as Greg mentioned also, he recognized that part-time student, uh, part-time teachers could not possibly provide stability and continuity in order to allow, especially the technical programs to uh, advance. He also realized, however, that the KIA could not afford to pay college level salaries. And so he recruited enthusiastic young artists to, whom he sensed could develop professionally and then teach and inspire non-traditional KIA students. 
to pass on what they had learned. So Kirk was devoted to the notion of quality in all things. There's the art center. There's Fred Maurice. And here's Kirk. So he was developed a very, you know, highly motivated for looking for quality. He expected students to take their studies seriously. And in fact, as he put it in the 1956, or, or I'm sorry, 1975 and 1976 KIA brochure, the philosophy of the school assumes a seriousness on the purpose of the part of the student and a genuine desire to learn about and develop new ideas through active participation in class projects, which sometimes can be tricky getting adults to do something they, they probably weren't thinking of when they first walked into the studio. But he also says punctuality and regular attendance is expected. So he was, he was a taskmaster. So while he set high standards for the faculty and the KIE non-traditional students, he was always kind and helpful and he had a wry sense of humor. I can remember to this day that if I used four grammars and said something like, I wanted to know where such and such is, is at. And he would say, it's behind the at. Always. Did he ever do that to you? But you know, Kirk Newman really realized that the term art can be either a verb or a noun. It could be a verb if you're in the process of creating something. That in itself is a unique experience and worthwhile. And it can be then also a, a product, something that you look at in a gallery. In, in 2015, in an interview with Gazette, Kirk said, rather than have a few pictures around, the question was, what do people do with art. We were trying to give people a chance to actually experience arts. Once you experience trying to make things, it's very different than just being an observer. Then it becomes a unique experience. So whether or not you're successful at producing what you had in mind, the process of learning itself is life changing and very valuable. Now we get back to this point about uh, projects. I can remember one time giving a project of a, to the ceramics program of a teapot, a tea set. And one energetic student, her name is Ruta Perns, really liked this idea. But she was also aware that it was free. It wouldn't, she wouldn't be charged for her kiln units. We, we control could the amount of work being made in the ceramics program by the use of kiln units. So, but she realized that a project, if done properly, would not be, would not be charged. So the teapot ended up being about like, like this. The cups were vases, so six of those. <laughs> so anyway, that's the kind of thing you run into sometimes when you're working with adults, students. <laughs> but, um, okay, anyway, as soon as the, the new Genevieve and Donald Gilmore Art Center were opened, was open, uh, the class, the art, uh, the children's classes and adult, adult offerings expanded. The focus at the time was on painting, drawing, printmaking, ceramics, sculpture, and photography, jewelry, and weaving, with all of the specialized equipment that you need to do those things. I need to keep up with this. You'll have to remind me to change the slides. In time, additional programs were added, which also needed dedicated studio spaces. And, and that included um, computer arts, Paper making, or paper making, yep. We had added a sculpture 
foundry, we had fused glass. All of these variety programs made this schools uh, a, a, a much richer place to come to. We even offered, were able to offer classes for diverse audiences, which included the accessible arts programs, which for people with various disabilities, which is an ongoing program uh, yet today. And a shout out right away again, the, the faculty members were always really ready to take on a challenge. I mean, I never had any problem trying to get enthusiasm from the faculty. Uh, if, if there was uh, something interesting out there, they were really uh, ready to go after it. Now, a little bit about me. Um, I joined the KIA faculty 50 years ago. This is a kind of a special year. Okay, so it's 50 years uh, since I came here. And we just finished holding the 50th holiday sale. Now, there's a coordination there. You get the, you know, you get the idea. But um, also, um, it is then, uh, well, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I kind of get, I get, if I start to talk ad lib, then I, then I lose track of where I'm, my, what I've written down. So I, I'm sorry. But at any rate, 50 years ago is when I came. And I got to tell you how it started, because it's, Kind of an interesting story. Uh, I was finishing up my master program at Illinois State University, and my teacher was Tom Malone. One of my advisors was Tom Malone. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but Tom Malone had been the head of the ceramics program years, a few years before he came to Illinois State. So he was very familiar with the KIA and, in fact, had built uh, one of the major kilns that was here at the time. Well, at any rate, in the middle of the week, I get a phone call from Tom Malone in the afternoon saying he was about ready to leave to come up to Michigan. And I would probably like to come with him because he, there was an interesting art center that he'd like to show me. So he had me bundle up a few things. Uh, he said, oh, and remember now, they have a gallery shop. So bring some pots. You know, they might, they might buy something from you. Well, that really was that perked my interest right there. So anyway, we, he bundles me up and we drive up to, uh, to Michigan in his van. And while he's, he's showing me around the studios, uh, the, uh, the administration, Kirk Newman, were looking for a new ceramics teacher. So after a couple of interviews, um, uh, I joined the faculty member as a faculty member in the fall, of, um, right after I graduated. But I got to tell you now, Kirk Newman, let's get this kind of personal, but Kirk Newman was a mentor for me and many other artists. But for me in particular, he was more than that. He became a real friend. Um, and he took an interest not only in uh, me as a, in a professional way, but he introduced me to people around town to help me feel at home. And he even helped my wife, uh, Karen, to, uh, by introducing her to Marion Andros, who was the coordinator for the arts program at the Calumet Public Schools. And so a couple of years later, my wife was able to, when she was ready, become a faculty member in, in, in the Kalamazoo Public School System. But just as Kirk had done, I keep, I kind of keep moving these things forward. There we are, 50 years ago. Yeah. But just as Kirk had done, I relied on energetic, dedicated artists to become our faculty, encouraging them to develop as professional artists and pass on what they had learned was my main concern. It was my main priority to support them as they came up with new ideas for classes and techniques and to do all I could to help them to succeed. Well, 
Um, a year after I came to the KIA, let's see if we can scoot forward here. I should have been showing you these all along, give you some idea of the scope of the equipment necessary. A lot of these photos look like they, they're a, it's a workshop somewhere. Oh, look. <laughs> now, I, I had warned Greg that this slide was in there. And the truth to be told, this is this was not uh, from the school. Uh, this was Greg uh, at an art doing an art reach presentation, which was a fantastic program that we had done for years, part of museum education. But um, it's such a cool picture. I just, I just had to had to include that. Yeah. So the sculpture studios, equipment outside. We built that was one of the additions uh, that we we got that early on. And that was to uh, come up with a foundry so we could actually do bronze casting here at the KIA. This is part of the sculpture studio. The ceramic studios. Ceramic kilns, our rock hoof setup outside. And this is our brand new salt kiln that Julie Devers has, uh, is firing now with good success, I hope. Right. And then this is, this is our pride and joy. This is an Anagama kiln, which is a wood fired Japanese style kiln. And this is an interior shot of it. And these are the kilns that, uh, some of the kilns that I first put up, uh, taking a space that um, of Tom Malone's first kiln. Now this is an interesting shot of the uh, glaze making studios. You see those funny looking nozzles that sort of come down from the roof? Those are called uh, localized vents or slotted vents. So it, they're designed to remove the dusts or contaminants right at the source so they don't spread through the room which of course helped the KIA because then there's less cleaning up to do and also uh, heating and cooling of the, of the building because they don't take a lot of air out. Some more equipment. Yeah. Photography de developing station, the print room, All right, so now we get to uh, I'll talk about the, the holiday sale a little bit. And, and I, think, I think we were going to turn over this to uh, Denise Osecki at this point. Well, I thought Tom was going to join me in some old war stories about the holiday sale. Um, as Tom mentioned, in 1973, they had the first holiday sale, and it was the first Sunday in December for four hours to raise money for a kiln. It went on for 10 years, and when I became the chair of the 2D department, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to add printmaking? Because people can buy prints, they're affordable. So in the 11th year, um, in what's now the back gallery here, we set up a little print exhibition with bins. And as we waited, the crowds came in, practically knocked us over, went back to ceramics, but then came and purchased prints. And we started our first collaboration with ceramics, putting in an additional media. In the following years, all the departments followed suit. The sale went from two days expansion. We moved it from Sunday to Friday night and Saturday. And then we um, decided just a couple years ago with all the competition that we were getting from all the sales that we would move it a little earlier. And we decided to do a weekend before Thanksgiving, which is now our present time. But if, people feel that it should be moved again, uh, you know, that's 
you know, something that the sale has always been kind of free flowing. And each year we try to do something a little different to make the sale fresh. So you have to realize when Tom and I first did the sale together, we were working with handwritten receipts spread out over tables and the artists were then, the receipts were put in certain piles and artists were put on sheets. Everything was done by hand. And then eventually we had a donor who provided the um, scanners and the computer uh, hardware so that we could now be very efficient with our bar barcode scanning. Um, I also wanted to mention, you know, the holiday sale was sort of a bridge between Tom's tenure and mine. The visiting artist workshop was a bridge starting with Kirk Newman. In 1962, Kirk Newman decided to bring in artists from all over the country, national recognized artists. And as an undergraduate in Ohio at Miami University, I would see these posters for the uh, Genevieve and, Gar and Donald Art Center. And so I was aware of the KIA before I even moved to Michigan. So the um, workshops have been um, going on since 1962, providing national and international artists, bringing them to this community so not only our local artists were be able to take advantage of this type of instruction, but we also drew artists from all over the country coming to the KIA to see the facilities, being overwhelmed by this place and uh, participating in these workshops and spreading our name nationally. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my tenure here. Um, as Greg briefly mentioned, I began by taking classes with Tom Kendall and in ceramics and this was when um, Tom became the director of the school. So I mentioned to him that I you know, was actually a printmaker and a painter. And I went down into the print room and I said, oh, you have a fabulous equipment down here. You have brand presses, you have a Griffin Litham press. This is amazing. And he said, well, how'd you like to be head of the printmaking department? And I said, oh yeah, okay, sure. Um, so I became head of the printmaking department and while I was teaching printmaking and um, overseeing the department, um, I became pregnant. And so Tom, in, once again, offered me the chair of 2D. And I had to break it to him that, well, I'm pregnant. And he said, no problem. So two weeks after my son was born, I became official chair of the 2D department. I then moved on to director of the, um, at that time was the KIA Art School. And um, my first job was to find homes for all the different classes because the building was being closed. So we found a ceramic studio that someone let us use. We used the parchment library. We used um, the uh, old Kalamazoo Central. We used the white building that's across the street. We had satellite classes all over the community. And that's how we held together the school for the year and a half, almost two years of the building being closed. Oh, and there's one thing I forgot to mention about the visiting artist workshops is that we got, we, our workshops grew and our um, ability to attract artists grew because we received a generous donation from Jim and Lois Richmond to subsidize our workshops. And so um, Tom was talking about different people that have helped us along the way with donations and helping us not only buy equipment, but expanding our programs. Um, in the, so we got back into the building and the mid and late 90s, we've expanded some of our classes. In 2002, we partnered with K College and started trips abroad. We began with a trip to Italy, and then in 2004, we took a trip to France. And then the rest of the trips up until, and these were biannual trips until 2012, were trips back to Italy. 
And so this gave our members and our students an um, opportunity to be able to go to Italy. And we also had Italian classes here so that people could learn uh, a little bit of the language. And uh, Billy Fisher, Dr. Billy Fisher from K College also taught an Italian Renaissance class here to prepare the people that were going on the trip and for anyone who was interested. In 2006, uh, the um, art school received a generous gift from Rosemary and John Brown. And with that gift, we were asked to rename the school, the Kirk Newman Art School. And that's how the art school got the name and um, a generous donation that was kept, um, that was supposed to be used, but was very carefully used throughout the years. And I'm, I think Leslie still has some of it. I was good with it. <laughs> and we purchased equipment. It was for professional development. It was for faculty pay. And so it helped the school in many aspects and for scholarships. So it was a multi-level donation to be used to really improve all aspects of the art school. Um, in, uh, so in the 21st century, we finally moved to um, providing registration online and the holiday sale online. For a short period of time, we had a blog. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and we also linked to YouTube. So all of that kind of got us up and running into the 20th, 21st century. Um, also in 2015, we started a residency program. And through this residency program, we've attracted between eight and 10 postgraduates, <clears throat> post-baccalaureate baccalaureate graduates to come and work in the school for about a year. It's, I think, a nine month program. And with this program, it not only gave a different demographic in the classroom because we had more uh, you know, younger people, college, right out of college students, and um, ideas you know, that came from all of their different areas. We not only attracted um, residents from uh, Western, but we had you know, all over the country, we had um, people coming from. And so it's been a great program for us. And it's also provided us with staff and faculty um, for the art school. So it was a good feeder for that. Um, in 2020, we had what was called the pandemic. And during this pandemic, we had to shut down. So in March, when it really started to hit, we were in the middle of spring registration. We had 500 students signed up for classes and we had to give back money to 500 students because there were no classes. We quickly scrambled and in at the end of April, early May, we came up with a abbreviated program and talked faculty members who never even knew what Zoom was into teaching on Zoom. We did all of this with no outside tech support like the universities had, but with our faculty who were tech savvy and on a wing and a prayer, we started our Zoom classes. In the summer of 2020, we decided to do a, an experiment to see if we could safely open on a very small level. So what we did was we had staff members teach classes with eight students wearing masks, six feet apart, trying all the safety measures. Well, it worked, no one got sick. We didn't spread any more COVID that we knew of. And in the fall, we reopened our classes on a very limited basis, once again, with eight students per class and continued the Zoom classes. And um, what good came out of this is that we have quite a few classes on Zoom that are working just fine. And um, it has, you know, opened up a whole new market for us. And so the pandemic, you know, we took some good things from it. Um, we've had partnerships over the years with different institutions. We had the Weavers Guild join us for a holiday sale. We've been with KRESA, the EFA classes 
for, I mean, they were, didn't they have that with you? So, I mean, over 30 years now, um, we have, uh, we've had classes with the Christian Heritage High School, the Nature Center, the Fetzer Institute, Richland Area Community Center. And just recently in 2021, we are, we have partnered with KBCC and KBCC has shut down a ceramics department and now say KBCC ceramics classes are offered here. Uh, the same thing is happening with the photo department. They have closed their black and white uh, photo studio. And so any black and white uh, traditional photography is also um, offered here. Um, we talked about for a long time um, when I was still working here, the staff and I were talking about how we have committed to certain aspects of the school over the years. We have always had a bronze casting um, boundary, and we're very fortunate to have Brett Harris, who is an excellent sculptor and bronze caster, run that foundry for us. We kept our weaving studio. Um, years ago, it was unpopular to teach weaving. So many universities and art centers dismantled their weaving studio and put something else there. Well, we kept ours and we're now up to 23 looms and always filled to capacity. We have the computer lab, which we have maintained. Um, we have a traditional black and white dark room, which a lot of uh, institutions no longer have. We have lithography stones. We have a huge library of lithography stones and a lot of the um, techniques are moving away from the stone to quicker, easier ways of printing lithographs, but there's nothing like drawing on a stone and printing from a stone. So we have maintained that and we have also um, built an offsite on a gamma kiln, which is a, a rarity for Michigan. So we have some very unique aspects of the school that we, um, at that time, were committed. And I'm sure Leslie, you know, will continue to commit to uh, maintain and you know make this our special mark. Um, I feel that um, we're returning to pre-pandemic times. Uh, the climate at the Kirk Newman Art School seems to be doing very well. Enrollment is back to pre-pandemic times, uh, numbers, and uh, intent, attendance at the school and, and at the school events seem to be very strong. So I want to thank the staff to, that has maintained the school until um, Leslie um, was hired. Um, that it was, you know, kept going, growing, and uh, is still a very vital institution. Thank you. So now we've covered ancient past, me, and recent past with Denise. Now a few words from Leslie Donaldson about the coming up future. Well, thanks. Oh, my goodness. It's, um, it's truly an honor and a privilege to be here with both Tom and Denise today and all of, all of you and the wonderful staff um, here at the KAA and all the amazing um, work that has happened prior to my arrival. Um, some of you might have heard my uh, art break talk uh, a couple of months ago. Um, so I just want to kind of underscore some of the things that both Tom and Denise have talked about and assure you that um, I am really excited to uh, support the foundation that has been created and to take a look at where we go in, as we approach our 100th anniversary as an institution. Um, so first, I, I want to go back to these slides here with Holiday Sale just quickly. Since Holiday Sale just ended, um, and I'm excited to share with you just over the three days of holiday sale, we had nearly 900 transactions from our three cash registers with each, um, each transaction generating, you know, people were buying at least three to four items each. So all of the work, um, for those of you that don't know about the holiday sale, um, we had 160 faculty and students um, enter uh, pieces for sale. Um, in the holiday sale. These are just a few beautiful examples of the work 
um, if you didn't get a chance to see um, or purchase. Um, and uh, I love this picture. And the lines that go completely out the door for all of the work um, that um, you can obtain for uh, for gifts for friends and, and family. And we, we do have an encore sale going on right now. So if you didn't get that special gift, um, we do have um, some items still available from some of our faculty and students um, for purchase through December 20th. Um, so please come see us. Um, and uh, for those of you that don't know, the holiday sale, 65% actually goes back to those artists that are participating, so the students and faculty. So we are supporting our local ecosystem of artists um, through the sale, as well as um, keeping to the roots of the holiday sale, which is to generate that remaining 35% that comes back to each department. So each department can purchase supplies and equipment throughout the entire year um, at the school. So you can feel good knowing that your gift is supporting our local community in so many different ways. And um, we do have an event that's coming up in March called Hands On. I haven't experienced it yet, so I'm hoping those of you <laughs> can tell me more about it. Um, but it is, it is like an open house, um, as I understand it, for those that want to just try their hand at some different things within the school. Um, and so we have glass making, we have different sorts of experiences and workshops and, you know, getting your hands messy and clay and all that good fun stuff. And even something for the little ones as well. Um, so I just wanted to kind of make a plug about all of that. I love all these little cute art projects by the kids. Love this so much. So um, just to underscore um, the uh, school enrollment numbers, um, so Denise mentioned that we are starting to um, regroup from the pandemic. You know, the pandemic was obviously hard for so many of us, including the school and our ability to engage in art making. Um, but you can see how our enrollment numbers um, actually translated over the last fiscal year. So we ended um, the last fiscal year in August of 2023. And you can see that we were nearly, as Tom mentioned earlier, close to 30, well, 3,400 enrollments. So that's amazing. Um, just under 500 classes throughout the entire year. And one thing that I want to mention is um, as we approach our 100th anniversary, um, I invite you to keep in close contact with us. Um, not only is the institution celebrating um, throughout the year, amplifying existing programs and so on and so forth, but the school is also looking to test out and pilot some different things um, along the way. And I think it's also a really important time for us as an institution and for all of us to come together and think about our history as an institution. And in particular for the school, this opportunity for us to build upon our, this incredible foundation that we've been talking about and consider where we might be going next. And to do this, I believe, so again, I've been here six months. I'm new to the Kalamazoo community. Um, I have a background in arts management. I'm a visual artist as well as a musician. Um, and I also am, uh, have a lot of experience with community engagement. So I feel like this, you all are my keeps. This is, this is my place. Uh, my heart is here. But I don't know the community well enough to, to understand what are people looking for? What are you all looking for? What does the community need in terms of arts um, making and arts engagement? And I think one of the ways that we can do this is to take a look at data that is available to us. So for those of you who attended my Art Break talk a couple of months ago, I talked a bit about how we can understand a little bit more about our neighborhoods, who lives in our community, what ways can we approach um, different um, these different neighborhoods, these different um, communities um, to in further engage them into the arts at the KAA. And in addition to zip code information, which is very quantitative sort of, you know, analytical dry way of looking at um, things. So we want to balance that with qualitative information. We want to hear about your stories. We want to know what students are looking for. 
Um, we can learn a lot about working with our uh, partners that we already have, maybe partners that we haven't yet engaged with, to just kind of hear what's going on in the community and things like that, so that we can continue to ensure in our 100th year and beyond um, that the arts really are for everyone. So we can also consider how some of our existing programs actually start to serve best practices in community arts education. So these are some of the things that I'm looking at and thinking about. We already do an amazing job in the school, but there are definitely ways in which we can enhance and tweak some of those things, again, as we think about going into our next 100 years. So we can continue to create space for personal well-being through art making. We can focus on equity and inclusion by expanding accessibility to our arts programs even further. We can empower identities and voices through the programs that we offer, and we can support creativity and technique through skill building. And examples of some of these things, we're already doing these things, but we can just tweak them a bit more. Maybe it's a pay what you can experience to create more space for art making, or maybe it's increasing the amount of scholarships that we're able to provide and or perhaps improving the reach of our scholarships, really going into the neighborhoods, understanding what our communities need and making sure that scholarship money is targeted and available uh, for folks that need it. Perhaps we can pursue enhanced collaborations with our external partners that help us offer new arts education offerings like, you know, we've done throughout our history as a school, but maybe we look at things like mural making or other types of experiences, educational experiences that we haven't yet um, uh, pursued. And we can continue to elevate um, that the stature of our visiting artists program and kind of get back to those days that you know Denise recognized when Kirk Newman was here and kind of elevating our re-elevating our visiting artist program again. So if you haven't recently, I see a lot of familiar faces in the room. So I know that many of you take classes with the school. So I already thank you for being so engaged and involved. Um, but I, I just want to invite you to participate in the school. I invite your feedback. We invite your feedback as staff, um, uh, your ideas for classes, things that um, you, know, you might be particularly interested in. And if by some chance you haven't been in the school in a while, please request a tour. I mean, we gave a little bit of a virtual tour today, um, but also just, just come in and, and we're happy to give you a tour of the school or sign up for a winter class explore the faculty review exhibition. There's a little picture of uh, a work by Tom Kendall right there. Um, visit our um, holiday sale, the Encore sale up through uh, December 20th um, and join us for hands-on and so much more. So um, with that, I'm gonna quickly turn it back to Tom to kind of close us out here today. The future looks bright, doesn't it? Well, I want to thank you all for coming and thank Leslie and Denise also. I'll just finish up by saying a couple things here. There we go. The Kirk Newman Art School has been successful because it's an enduring and integral part of the culture life of Kalamazoo. It's grown and prospered because it serves the community. The school has been helped along because of generous donations made by the community leaders who also understand its value. So to our benefactors, we are greatly indebted. I can honestly say that I was lucky personally, and I'm grateful Kirk Newman uh, hired me and allowed me to become a part of the KIA constellation of art and education. The experience has really changed my life. Well, thank you for coming, I appreciate it.